A little bit about Muksa Diety Bombay. Our initial work started in 2011-2012 when we started examining how to adapt to these MOOCs. We had two ambitions. One, to make our courses available to global learners. Second, to develop an indigenous platform which then could be used to do our larger dreams of skilling courses, high school courses, etc., which were not necessarily part of the original MOOCs conceptualizing. We studied Coursera, Udacity, and uh, uh, EDX. We had a committee, a very high-powered committee. Uh, the committee favored joining hands with EDX for two reasons. Number one, EDX is a not-for-profit company. There is nothing wrong with for-profit companies. I mean, IITs and IIMs work closely with them. But we have a natural affinity to somebody who is not-for-profit. But more important was that they had promised in 2012 that they will release the entire platform code base in open source. Now, we were very clear by observing how these platforms had developed, that if you want to develop a platform ab initio, it would take a minimum of two years, and then it would take one or two years to stabilize, and of course, there would be annual increment. Knowing that, we did not want to start from the scratch. So we're looking for something that we can start with and build on top. Our uh, committee finally endorsed our joining hands with EDX and we did sign an MOU in June 2013. We started designing the courses or when we started doing that, we suddenly found out that conventional teaching is far simpler because we have been doing it for years. Now we have to do so many other things, not used to it. Setting up a multiple choice quiz of five questions roughly takes three times more time to an experienced teacher like me than setting a conventional mid sem exam. But we spent that time, we experimented, we tested, we learned a lot. That is what the learning is. We offered our courses in 2014. We simultaneously started building our own platform. In between, the government changed and we were told that we should try and develop this as the national platform. So we actually ran a design contest in IIT Bombay. The name Swayam came from that contest. So we designed the logo, we designed the thing and we gave it to MHRD. But then MHRD in its wisdom decided to appoint a set of committees to assess how we should go forward. And you are all management gurus, so you know that when you convert an issue into committology, then what happens to it? So there are multiple committees which look at it and so on and so forth. And finally the decision has come and hopefully the swam will happen soon. Meanwhile, we had gone ahead. We launched our IIT Bombay X in 2015 January, on 26 January hurriedly. We are not concentrating in increasing the number of courses, but we are concentrating on experimenting with different models of MOOCs. And enlarging it for skilling and other courses. So I'll just explain a couple of things that we did. We added in Hindi transcription, by the way, to most of our courses because we believe that in India, multilingual courses, especially at the entry level of higher education and in high school education are absolutely mandated. I do not know about IIM, but in IIT Bombay, we routinely get students who are very poor in communication. And I'm not talking about BTEC first year students. I am talking about MTech and PhD students who are unable to communicate very well. Brilliant students otherwise. Of course, you solve that problem by not admitting anybody who cannot communicate. That facility we don't have because we admit based on the GATE score, which has nothing to do with communications. But nevertheless, that is one aspect that we believe is important. So we decided to try a blended MOOCs approach. The idea behind this approach was that we realized that the completion rate of people who enroll for a MOOC is very, very low. Typically, 4 to 8 percent. So if 1 lakh people enroll, hardly 5,000, 6,000 people finish. Of course, to train 5,000, 6,000 people normally would have taken years. But that bothered us and we tried to look at why the people were not completing. And we found out various reasons. First of all, the human interaction is missing in the MOOCs completely. The discussion forum is a good method for discussion. However, it is not natural to most students who have done discussions in face-to-face -face fashion in groups. So it is something unnatural. Secondly, there is a teacher 
who may be doing an extremely bad job of delivering lectures, but provides a cohesive group presence and ensures that the group is present in every class after class because of the compulsory attendance, assignment, discussion session, etc., etc. These are missing. I gave a talk, uh, invited lecture in a MOOCs conference, saying that, in my opinion, for engineering education, blend of MOOCs plus face-to-face -face education would probably be an ideal thing. And we decided we'll try this out. So the idea here was, we would say that we'll offer to partner institutions our MOOCs courses. Of course, their students can take them even independently. But we said, if you are willing to let your students learn from both the online courses as well as face-to-face -face courses that you do, then we'll train you on what is a flipped classroom. We'll discuss with you. We'll make available the score of your students on online quizzes on a regular basis. So we designed a dashboard for the participating teachers. We put only one condition. You must ensure that a percentage of marks scored on the MOOCs are factored into the final grade of your students in your university grade. Now, this obviously could not be done by plain affiliated colleges. But autonomous colleges, academically autonomous colleges could do it. I found out that there were about 400 autonomous institutions in the country in engineering education, out of which 100 were our remote centers. So I wrote to their directors, others, and called them if they are interested, could they come. About 55 people came. And they agreed to the terms and conditions that we'll give these courses. They will study these courses and decide what is the overlap. So some 35 institutions took one course, 37 another course. We just offered three courses. The agreement was that their students will enroll for MOOCs. They will study from MOOCs. And in the classroom, they will try at least for some topics to try and do a flipped classroom to see whether the students learn effectively or not. We also ran a faculty development program specially for those teachers who are participating in this, training them on how to run a flipped classroom, etc. Et the experiment was extremely successful. So this is something which attempts to combine face-to-face -face education plus learning through MOOCs for what I call mainstreaming of the MOOCs. Awarding weightage to both scores was the key factor in mainstreaming. Because the students generally don't care for either MOOCs or the local teachers if the percentage of marks do not come from either. So you had put a range of 20 to 80 percent, minimum 20 percent for MOOCs, minimum 20 percent for face to face, otherwise students will not value either. 50 plus remote centers joined. We offered three courses and we developed MIS for local teachers. In fact, it so turned out that I am Bangalore is planning actually a very similar thing in partnership with the institutions. And to my surprise, this particular feature appeared to be one which they needed. In the Open EDX conference, I have announced that we'll be releasing this on the GitHub formally so that other institutions can also adopt it from December. So here is the statistics. In January to June, in the first semester after launching of IIT Bombay X, when we offered the same three courses, there were 65,000 enrollments. Only about 5,000 people completed. In July to December, when we offered this in blended MOOCs, also available for general public, the total enrollment came down to 35,000. Why? Because earlier our courses were six weeks, eight weeks. Now they are four months duration because they have to synchronize with the semester. And generally, people are not interested in slogging for four months. So that was the reason why the enrollment came down. But 13,800 completed. Out of these 13,800, 11,500 were students of these blended books, experimental autonomous institutions, who had no choice but to complete because their marks for their university grade came from books, partly. Student philosophy is universally said. If you say a lot of knowledge you will gain, you should study this, they'll say thank you. If you say there is a one mark quiz, they will study overnight. Exactly same philosophy everywhere. So now it is not just the increase in the percentage of completion rate, but it is that unless you mainstream MOOCs, unless you factor the grades in what is recognized, which is today their grades and degrees, believe me, MOOCs will not flourish to the same extent and will not benefit.
and many institutions where there were serious teachers who actually practiced the flipped classroom where you don't give a lecture at all. You say you study Guy Tonde's lecture on thermodynamics, but we'll spend this one hour discussing zeroth law, first law of thermodynamics. I mean, we got uncanny feedback from both students and teachers. We talked to our seniors and they never learned the course like this. We seem to have learned better. There is research globally, the research at IIT Bombay, that a flipped classroom method significantly enhances the engagement of students. And given the same exam for two groups of control groups, one doing flipped classroom and one doing conventional education, the performance of flipped classroom student is better. The same spread of capabilities and talent in both the groups. So this has been time and again proven everywhere. But it is not easy to adapt this. Professor Kannan who has been teaching flipped classroom for five years. I started doing it three years ago. It is much harder work to do because it's not easy to design problems for discussion session. So the cost of two minutes, I'll explain how I conducted a programming course in this mode and I found, I've been teaching programming for donkey's years, for 40 years, but I found tremendous improvement in programming skills and engagement. The method is as follows. You are told to view the lectures. Invariably, people do this. They don't view the lectures. They come saying, kya hai? So I would conduct a first quiz at the beginning, which will just test whether you have viewed it or not. And because half mark is associated with that quiz, everybody views that. The actual class goes like this, they are given a problem. So first, initially, every individual solves a problem. Then we do what is known as a think-pair-share, where we ask them to exchange their answers with their neighbors. So instead of two neighbors, we made groups of eight to ten students, and we allocated it to each group. And there will be five minutes discussion with that group, and that group is supposed to come up with a composite solution, which is probably the most correct. And there are many such groups because the class has 300 people. Then out of these groups, I will be moving around with my colleague. I will randomly pick out three solutions, which are written, handwritten, and project them in front of people. Now, when I project the first solution, I ask the entire class, can you spot any mistakes? Believe me, students are delighted to find mistakes in other people's solutions. This is a huge application of mine. A semicolon nahi hai, if statement galat hai, logic thik nahi hai. But you see, what is happening is everybody is learning. Then we take the next example, then we take the next example. Fifteen minutes are spent in this, but enormous learning. We are able to do only two or three problems in one session. But the engagement is absolutely phenomenal. Now, this is our experience. We would like this experience to be actually implemented at every place where education happens. It will take time, but we don't have much time. That's the problem.